As I remember, Ada, who was upon this fashion, bequeathed to me by his own will the poor thousand crowns, and as thou sayest, charged my brother upon his blessings to breed me well. And there begins my sadness. My brother Jacquees he keeps at school, and retorts me goldenly, goldenly of his profit. But as for my part, he keeps me rustically at home, or in more proper terms, keeps me at home unkept. For call you that keeping for a gentleman of my birth, that differs not from the stalling of an ox. His horses are bred, uh, better, for besides that they are fair in their feeding, taught their manage, and to the end riders yearly hire. But I, his brother, gain nothing under him but growth, to the which his animals on his dunghills are as bound to him as I. <sighs> besides this nothing that he so plentifully gives me, something that nature gave me his countenance, he seems to take away from me. He leads me the feet of his hinds, bars me the place of a brother, and to which he lies my spontaneity with my education. <sighs> This is it, Ada, that grieves me. And, is, and the spirit of my father, which I think is within me, has begun to mutiny against the servitude. I will tarry it no longer, though yet I know no voice rep me how to avoid it. Not because my master, your brother. Go apart, Ada, and thou shalt hear how he will shake me up. Now, sir, what make you here? Nothing, sir. I'm not taught to make anything. What mar you then, sir? I'm hoping you are one of God's creations, a poor, unworthy brother of yours, with idleness. Mary, sir, be not a while, and be better employed. Oh, should I tend your hogs any husks with them? Or prodigal portion have I spent so much to come to such penury? Know you where you are, sir? I, sir, here in your orchard. Know you before whom, sir? I. Better than him, I am before knows me. I know you are my older brother, and in the gentle condition of blood you should so know me. But the courtesy of nations allows you my better in that you are the firstborn. But the same tradition takes not away our blood, or the twenty brothers between us. I have, I have as much of my father in me as you, albeit I must confess you coming before me is near to his reverence. White boy! Oh. <laughs> Come on, other brother. You're too young. Uh, 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 what the lay hands on me, villain? I am no villain. I am the youngest son of Sir Rowland the boys. He was my father, and he is thrice the villain that says my father begot villains. Were thou not my brother, I will not take my hand from thy throat until my other hand hath pulled out thy tongue for saying so. Thou hast railed myself. Sweet masters, be patient for your father's remembrance. Be out of court. Let me go, I say. I will not till I please. You shall hear me. My father charged you in his testament to give me good education. He hath treated me like a peasant, obscuring and hiding from me all gentlemanlike qualities. Therefore, uh, allow uh, such exercise as may become gentlemen, or give me the poor lottery he left me by testament. With that, I'll go by my fortunes. And what will thou do? Beg when that is meant? Well, get you in. I will not long be troubled with you. You shall have some part of your will. I pray you, leave me. I will no further offend you than it becomes for my good. Get you with him, you old dog. Is old dog my reward? Most true. I lost my teeth in your service. God was my old master. He would not have spoke such a word. Is it even so? Begin you to grow upon me? I'll physic your ring this and give no thousand crowns neither. Ah. Holla, Denise! Calls your worship. Was not Charles, the Duke's wrestler, here to speak with me? So please you, he is here at the door and importunes access to you. Call him in. T'will be a good way, and tomorrow the wrestling is. Good morrow to your worship. Ah, good one, Sir Charles. What's the new news at the new court? There's no news at the court, sir, but the old news. That is, the old Duke is banished by his younger brother, the new Duke, and three. What if four loving lords have put themselves into voluntary exile, whose lands and revenues shall enrich the new duke? Therefore, he gives them good leave to wander. Can you tell if Rosalind, the duke's daughter, be banished with her father? Oh, no! The duke's daughter, her cousin, so loves her, being ever from their cradles brought together, that she would have followed her into exile and have died to stay behind her. She has left the court, sir, and no less beloved of her uncle than his own daughter. And never do ladies love as they do. <laughs> Where will the old duke live? They say he's already in the forest of Arden, and many, many men with him. And then they live like the old Robin Hood of him. They say many young gentlemen flee to his 
worship every day and read the time carelessly as they did in the golden age. What? Wrestles, don't you wrestle tomorrow before the new duke? Many do I said, and I came to acquaint you with the matter. I am given said, secretly, to understand that your younger brother Orlando had the disposition to come in against me to try fall. Tomorrow, sir, I wrestle for my credit, and that he escapes me without some sort of broken limb shall acquit him well. Your brother is but young and tender and loving, and I would be loath to foil him as I must if he come in. Therefore, I came in hither to acquaint you with all, that either you might stay him from such intendment or brook such disgrace, as it is altogether against my will. Charles, I thank thee for thy love to me, which thou shalt find I will most kindly requite. I had myself notice of my brother's purpose in here, herein, and have, by underhanded means, labored to dissuade him from it. I, but he is resolute. I'll tell thee, Charles, it is the stubbornest young fellow of France, full of ambition, an envious emulator of every man's good parts, a secret and villainous contriver against me, his natural brother. Therefore, use thy discretion. I had as lief thou didst break his neck as his finger, <laughs> and thou wert best look to it. For if thou dost him any slight disgrace, or if he do not mightily grace himself on thee, he will practice against thee by voice, <gasps> and trap thee by some treacherous device, and never leave thee obtain thy life by some... Indirect means or other. Uh, for I assure thee, and there is not for I assure thee, there is not one so young and so villainous to stay living. I speak but brotherly of him, but should I not devise him to thee as he is, I must blush and weep, and thou must look pale and wonder. I am heartily glad I came hither to you. If he come in tomorrow, I'll give him his payment, and so keep your worship. Farewell. Now will I stir this gamester. I hope I shall see an end of him, for my soul, yet I know not why, hates nothing more than he. Yet he's gentle, never schooled, and yet learned, full of noble device of all sorts enchantingly beloved, and indeed so much in the heart of the world, and especially of my own people, that I am altogether misprized. But it shall not be so long. This wrestler shall clear all. Nothing remains but that I kindle the boy thither, which now I'll go about. I pray thee, Rosalind, sweet my cause, be merry. Dear Celia, I show more mirth than I am mistress of. And would you, yet I were merrier? Unless you can teach me to forget a banished father, you may not learn me to remember any extraordinary pleasures. Herein I see thou lovest me, not with the full weight that I love thee. If my uncle, thy banished father, had banished thy uncle, the duke, my father, so wouldst thou hadst been still with me. I could have taught my love to take thy father for mine. So wouldst thou the truth of thy love were so righteously tempered as mine is to thee. I will forget the condition of my estate to rejoice in yours. My father hath no child but I, nor none is like to have, and truly when he dies, thou shalt be his heir. For what he hath taken from thy father perforce, I will render thee in affection again. By mine honor I will, and when I break that oath, let me turn monster. <laughs> Therefore, my sweet rose, my dear rose, be merry. Mm. From henceforth I will, cuz. And devise sports. Let me see. What think you of falling in love? Mary, I pretty do. To make sport with all, I love no man in good earnest, nor no further in sport than the safety of a pure blush that thou mayest come off again. What will be our sport then? Let us sit and mock the good housewife fortune from her wheel, that her gifts may henceforth be bestowed equally. I would we could do so, for her benefits are mightily misplaced. <laughs> And the bountiful blind woman doth most mistake in her gifts to women. Tis true, for though she makes fair, she scarce makes honest. And though she makes honest, she makes very ill-favoredly. Nay, thou goest from fortune's office to nature's. Fortune reigns in the gifts of the world, not in the lineaments of nature. No? When nature hath made a fair creature, has she not by fortune fallen into the fire? When, although nature hath given us the wit to... Wow, at fortune, has fortune not said in this school to cut off the argument? Indeed, there is fortune too hard for nature, when fortune makes nature's natural to cut her off of nature's wit. Peradventure, this is not fortune's work, but nature, 
who perceive with a natural wit too dull to reason of such goddesses. Oh, uh, you must, mistress, you must come away to your father. Were you made the messenger? No, by mine honor, but I was bid to come for you. Where learned you that oath, oh, fool? Of a certain knight that swore by his honor the pancakes were good, and swore by his honor the mustard was not. Now I'll stand to it, the pancakes were not, and the mustard was good, and yet was he not forsworn. How prove you that in the great heap of your knowledge? I marry now unmuzzled wisdom. Stand you both forth now. Stroke your chins and swear by our beards that I am a knave. By our beards, if we had them, thou art. By my knavery, if I had it, then I were. But if you swore that that is not, you are not forsworn. No more was this knight swearing by his honor, for he never had any. If he had, he sworn it away before he ever saw those pancakes or that mustard. Who is it that thou meanest? One that old Frederick, your father, loves. My father's love is enough to honor him. Enough! Speak no more of him. You'll be whipped for taxation one of these days. The more pity that fools may not speak wisely what wise men do foolishly. By my troth, thou sayest true, for the little wit that fools have was silenced, and the little foolery that wise men have makes a great show. <laughs> Here comes Mademoiselle Belle. With their mouths full of news. But they will put on us as pigeons feed their young. Then we shall be news crammed. Fair princess, you have lost much good sport. Sport of what color? What color, madam? How shall I answer you? As wit and fortune will. You amaze us, ladies. We would have told you of good wrestling, which you have lost sight of. We will tell you the beginning. And if it pleases your ladyships, you may hear the end. But the best is yet to do. And here, where you are, they are coming to perform. Ah! It was the beginning that he said and Barry. There comes an old man and his three sons. I can match this beginning with an old tale. Three proper young men of excellent growth and presence. With signs on their necks, let it be known unto all men by these presents. <laughs> <laughs> the eldest of the three wrestled. Charles, the Duke's wrestler, and in which in a moment Charles threw him and broke three of his ribs. There is little hope and life in him. So he served the second, and so the third. Yonder they lie, the poor old man, their father, making such pitiful dole over him that all the beholders take his part with weeping. <laughs> oh, yes. What is the sport, mademoiselle, that the ladies have lost? Why, Why this that we speak of? Men may become wiser every day. I've never heard of breaking of ribs as a sport for ladies. Or I, I promise thee. But is there any else longs to see this broken music in his sides? Is there yet another dote upon rib breaking? Shall we see this wrestling, cuz? You must if you stay here. For here is the place appointed for the wrestling, and they are ready to perform it. Yonder, sure they are coming. Let us stay and see it. Come on, since the youth will not be entreated, his own peril on his forwardness. Is yonder the man? Even he, madam. Alas, he is too young, yet he looks successfully. How now, daughter and cousin, are you come hither to see the wrestling? Aye, my liege, so please you give us leave. You take little delight in it, I can tell you. There is such odds in the man. I would fain dissuade him, but he will not be entreated. Speak to your ways, see if you can move him. Come hither, good mademoiselle Abel. Do so, I'll not be by. You do not the challenger, and the princess calls for you. <laughs> I attend them with all respect and duty. Young man. Have you challenged Charles, the wrestler? No, fair princess. He is a general challenger. I have come in as but many to try him with, with the strength of my youth. Young gentlemen, your spirits are too bold for your years. You have seen cruel proof of this man's strength. If you saw yourself with your own eyes or knew yourself with your own judgment, the fear of your adventure would counsel you to a more equal enterprise. We pray you for your sake and embrace your own safety and give over this attempt. Do, young sir, your reputation shall not be misprized. We will make it our suit to the Duke that the wrestling might not go forward. I beseech you, fair princess. Punish me not with your hard thoughts, or I must confess be much guilty to deny such fair and excellent ladies anything. But let your fair eyes and gentle wishes come with me to my trial, wherein if I be foiled, there is but one shame that was never gracious. If I be killed, but one dead that was willing to be so. 
I have done my friends no wrong, for I have none to lament me. The world no evil, for in it I have nothing. Only in this world I fill up a place which may be better supplied when I have made it empty. The little strength I have, I would it were with you. And mine to eke out hers. Oh, very well. Pray heaven I'd be deceived in you. Your heart's desires be with you. Come, where is this young gallant that's so desirous to lie with his mother? Ready, sir, when his will hath given and more modest looking. You shall try with one fall. No. I want it, your grace. You shall not greet him to a second. Thou shalt have mighty to weak others waited him to a first. You mean to mock me after, not have mocked me before. Sisters, 
But I can tell you that as of late, this duke hath tanned his pleasure against his gentle niece. Granted upon no other argument that they praise her for her virtues and pity her for her good body, father's sake. And on my life, his malice against the lady will suddenly break forth. Hereafter, in a world better than this, we shall we shall desire more knowledge and love of you. Very well. I thank thee. Very well. <sighs> from the smoke into the smother, from frying pan into frying brothers, from tyrant duke into tyrant brother, but heavenly Rosalind. <laughs> Cheerful. 
Knowest thou the duke hath banished me, his daughter? That he hath not. No, hath not? Rosalind lacks the love which teacheth thee that thou and I am one. Shall we be sundered? Shall we part, sweet girl? No, let my father seek another heir. Therefore, devise with me how we may fly, whither to go and what to bear, and do not seek to take change upon you and bear your griefs and leave me out. For by this heaven, for by this heaven, now at our sorrow's pale, say what thou can't, I'll go along with thee. Why, whither shall we go? To seek my uncle in the forest of Arden. Alas, what danger will it be to us, maids as we are, to travel forth so far? Beauty provoketh thieves sooner than gold. I'll put myself in poor and mean attire, and with a kind of upper smirk on my face, the like do you, so we shall pass along and never serve assailants. And were it not better, because I am more than common tall, that it did suit me all points like a man? A gallant curdle axe upon my thigh, a boar spear in my hand, and in my heart lie there what hidden woman's fear will. We'll have a swashing and a marshal outside, as other mannish cowards do, that do not face it with their semblances. What shall I call you when thou art a man? I'll have no worse name than Job's on page. Therefore, look, you call me Ganymede. But what shall you be called? Something that hath a reference to my state. No longer Celia, but Aliena. But cousin, what if we assail to steal that foolish clown out of your father's court? Would he not be accompanied to our travels? So go along over the wide world for me. Leave me alone to woo him. Let's away and get our jewels and our wealth together and devise the safest time and the fittest place to hide from pursuit that will be made after my flight. Now we go into content, to liberty and not to banishment. 